So without further ado, um, it is now half past seven and we will crack on with the webinar. So I'm Jamie McCoy. I'm one of the knowledge exchange managers at AHDB Dairy. Um, and I know a number of you were expecting Jenny Gibbons to be on tonight. I'm afraid due to unexpected circumstances, she can't be with us. Um, so you've got me instead, um, but I am joined by a really high caliber um, expert panel who I will introduce in a moment. Um, so thanks very much for joining us. Um, especially if you're listening live. If you're watching again on YouTube later, then um, do remember to hit subscribe button for more AHDB um, content. Um, I also hope a number of you who are joining tonight managed to get one of the delegate packs which we've posted out. Um, we have been inundated with requests and I'm delighted to say we've been able to extend that offering beyond the original planned 200. Um, if you were one of the lucky ones to get one of those, then you should have had a couple of thermometers, our new housing guide, um, amongst other things. And I do wonder how many people are eating the biscuits now or whether those biscuits just got eaten as you opened your post. Um, so we have at AHDB Dairy just launched um, an Instagram page. So if you're tweeting or posting on socials, we would love to see where those thermometers are on your farms, how you're using them, and hopefully see that they're making a difference. So please do tag us either AHDB Dairy or AHDB Beef and Lamb, um, depending on your respective sectors. Um, and we'd like to continue the conversation about how we can make those resources as useful as possible to you in tackling pneumonia on farm. So to introduce our panel this evening, hopefully they'll flick their cameras on now just so that you know that uh, they're with us. I'm, I'm joined by Kat Hart, Ginny Sherwin and, and Mike King. So could each of you just say hello and introduce where you're from? Ginny, we'll come to you first. And don't forget the mute button as well, please. <laughs> Hi, Jamie. Hi, my name's Ginny Sherwin. I'm a clinical associate professor at the University of Nottingham. I spend a large amount of my time uh, involved with herd health, and my main focus is young stock, uh, kind of a holistic approach in terms of both management, nutrition, and also health. Brill, Kat, we'll come over to you. Hello there, um, good evening. I'm in the office today, so sorry if there's any cars driving past, but I thought that would be better than being at home with the kids screaming upstairs. So um, yeah, I'm Kat Hart. I'm based in uh, Wiltshire with the George Farm Vets. Um, I've been a vet for 12 years now and really passionate about the young stock side. So really focusing, I guess, on um, housing, nutrition, and of course the wider health implications within young stock. Brilliant. Mike. Hi, my name's uh, Mike King. i based in South Gloucestershire. Um, currently milking 740 cows. Um, I supply a retail contract. Uh, we have undergone a few changes on the calf uh, side of our business, uh, really focusing on uh, um, prevention, growth rates, uh, building design. Uh, and uh, labour saving and team morale particularly. Great, so we'll pick your brains about a lot of that as, as we go through the session. Um, I suppose we know that pneumonia is one of the most significant diseases affecting calves um, and on the invites all our attendees will have seen that it's been estimated to cost 50 million pounds a year to the uk cattle sector which is just a number that really blows my mind it's it, it seems colossal um but i suppose with that challenge comes the opportunity that if we can make improvements in that area then there's effectively um you know money there to be clawed back into the sector so um Pneumonia is the leading cause of calf mortality on both dairy and beef farms, and we'll we'll dig into some of the whys and hows of that as we go on. But I think, Mike, you picked up a really important uh, point there about how stressful it is. And if we acknowledge how stressful it is dealing with 
sick animals, particularly calves. Um, it, it's not just the financial cost that is the burden on the farmer. I think it's also the burden extends to the the manage the, those people managing those calves and, and causes them stress too. So anything that we can do to reduce pneumonia is going to improve calf welfare, it's going to reduce mortality, hopefully reduce costs associated with de dealing with the disease and also result in a, a happier working environment for those people working with calves. So, um, and I suppose that's all without mentioning the opportunity to reduce antibiotic use in, in treating cases. So that's why when we were planning this series at AHDB, we kind of chose the strap line, um, you know, plan, prevent, protect anything that we can do in, in those three zones should hopefully reduce the incidence and, and, and make improvements on farm. So, so Ginny, if I can come to you first, just to kick off the discussion. Um, we are sort of in that November time now, probably starting to see snuffles, maybe even hearing the odd calf coughing. Um, but maybe you can start us off with kind of what the difference is between clinical and non-clinical pneumonia, and we'll take the discussion from there. Yeah, perfect. Um, I can't see the slides anymore. No, I think they'll be they'll be on the way back now. I'm right, sure. That's fine. I was just checking; it wasn't me being silly. So we talk a lot about pneumonia, or you'll often hear vets refer to it as bovine respiratory disease. And that's because it's a complex of lots of different diseases and it doesn't just involve the lungs, it can also involve the upper respiratory tract. But what does it actually mean when we're looking on farms? Well, I think we've probably all seen the snuffy calf, or as you said, Jamie, you go into the shed and you hear the coughing, or you see them. <laughs> and that for us is a clinical sign. And quite often there's the overt clinical signs where we've got the off and the discharges, so the runny eyes, the snotty noses the laboured breathing, the involvement of the abdomen breathing, the coughing. But then we've also got some more subtle signs which often come much earlier on. And that's things like the elevated temperatures, so anything over 39 and a half degrees C. Um, and also changes in behaviour. So calves similar to us when we start to get kind of a cold or flu, they don't want to eat or drink as much, they don't play as much, so it might be slightly isolating. Often, if you've got guys on automatic feeders, you might see quite a few changes in things like unrewarded visits, milking speeds. There might not be milk volume down, but that might not be the only thing. So we've got more subtle signs that we, we can start to pick up on things that we can see. That's great because that's something that we can see and we can go and look at. The problem we also have is we've then got this subclinical disease. And it's, this is the animals where we do have inflammation, respiratory disease going on, but they don't give us any signs. They're the animals that are still eating, drinking, perfectly fine, no coughing. And it's really interesting, especially now as we get into the world of thoracic ultrasound, then actually we are starting to see more of these animals coming through. And things like, um, we've got animals that have shown no clinical signs, but if you scan them thoracic ultrasound, we will see that 20% of that lung has been compromised already. Um, so that's 20% of lung capacity down without us even knowing. And what was really interesting is that actually, when you look at the post-mortem uh, data that's coming through from APHA, so if you have any dead calves and you've sent them in for post-mortem, in kind of 2023, in what they call Q2, so around that kind of springtime, the top two diagnostics that we were seeing for cat all cattle diseases was either pneumonia caused by pastorella or pneumonia caused by manhyemia. If you look back to 2022, so that's 2023 results, so if you look back at 2022, we were talking more about pneumonia with mycoplasma as the top one, but then cryptosporosis and failure of passive transfer in calves coming through as number two and three. And if we go back, kind of uh, 2015 up to 2023, then actually respiratory disease didn't enter that top three. So it's something that's becoming more prominent on farms, whether that hopefully means we've got other diseases under control more, but also it might be an indication that 
as you said, kind of we've got this November, but actually we've had this quite warm wet weather throughout the entirety of this summer. So this year has been a very different year in terms of respiratory disease, and we are tending to see a lot more of it. Um, I'm afraid I still can't get my slides to work, but I don't think that matters. I think I've said everything I was going to say. It just was a pretty picture of the car to look at instead. OK, hopefully Steve can have a go at um, resharing those slides so that perhaps we can see some of those pictures because there's some, some nice pictures on there. Um, I think one one of the things we'd started off talking about is the impact of you know the cost of cases on farm and I sort of said that 50 million pound a year seems mind-blowingly huge but when we break that down into sort of individual cases what what does that look like and where is where's the where's the where's the true cost I suppose Ginny yeah perfect um great question and we like to throw around big numbers like 50 million pounds sounds like a lot mm. um all right i was hoping to be able to get onto the next slide steve could you just advance to the next slide for me please it says impact of brd me taking control isn't working but when we start to look at it we can look at it in two different areas really and the first thing that i wanted to talk about was some really really good research coming out of Canada from David Rennell's group. So those guys looked at respiratory disease. When they looked at calves, they had over 2,600 calves that they looked at in that kind of first 77 days, I think it was. And they looked at the impact of different diseases and that included respiratory disease. And for these guys, they were daily monitoring using one of the Wisconsin style calf scoring systems and they did thoracic ultrasound. And what was really interesting is in that kind of what outcomes did they start to see in that pre wean period, the mortality rate actually went up 11% from that 2% mortality baseline rate. So if they had respiratory disease, 13% of them died compared to the 2% that didn't. And the other thing that they saw was just decrease in daily live weight gain, which was worth kind of 180 grams a day. And these guys would have been aiming for about 0.8, 0 0.9 kilos a day. So, that's, you know, that's getting close to a quarter of the growth rate loss just through respiratory disease. And if we start to think about why that might be, we've got these lungs, and lungs are a phenomenal organ. They're, you know, we all know they're there to oxygenate blood, but why is that so important? Well, actually, we need oxygen to be able to metabolize whatever diet we're feeding the animal. It doesn't matter what animal it is, it doesn't matter what age it is. We need that oxygen to metabolise the diet to get the maximum energy out. If we don't have enough oxygen, we go into what we call anaerobic metabolism and we don't get enough energy out. So as soon as we compromise part of those lungs, if you remember I said that we've got some subclinical animals that show us absolutely no indication, but when we look either scanning or post-mortem, 20% of the lungs have been compromised, despite the fact they've never been treated for respiratory disease before, we start to knock out a fifth of our lungs, our oxygen carrying capacity just goes. And actually, lung isn't very good at regenerating. There is indications that we can aerate some of the lung, but it's really difficult to do. So normally when we've trashed a bit of lung, that's it, it's ruined. So with that, if we ruin part of the lung, we reduce the amount of oxygen we can take in the blood. And with that, we reduce the amount of energy we can get out of the diet effectively. So that means that we're compromising whatever our production outcome is. And if we think of calves up to that point of first calving, all we want to do, whether it's beef calves or sorry, dairy calves, and my brain will always go straight to dairy heifers, so apologies to anybody on the beef side, but it's exactly the same idea. Our outcome for young stuff is growth. We want these animals to grow, we want them to grow well, and we want to, to do it in an economic and sustainable manner. So we know in the work in that pre weaning period, it had a big impact of 180 grams per day. Another very clever chap called Sebastian Savinsky took all of the research that there was back in 2001 on respiratory disease and looked at all of the different outcomes and said, right, what impact is this having? And he showed a difference of 67 grams per day, but there was a wide variation of 34 to 99. And this is in um, 
dairy heifers, so apologies for the beef guys. But there was a wide variation within the study. But what was really interesting, if we think one of our biggest outcomes actually should be, how much does it cost me to, for each kilo of body weight that I gain? And actually, it was an increase of 5.6 to 9.77% per kilo. So economically, we're having to put a lot more feed in to get that same growth because we can't utilise the feed that's going in. The other thing as well is, if you've ever seen a post-mortem of respiratory disease, often in calves, it looks like somebody that has smoked eight to cigarettes for 50 years. And the vet will have their boot in there trying to pull the lungs off because we've just ruined the lungs. If they can't oxygenate the blood and they can't get the energy out, we are going to struggle. And with that, we see this increased exit rate. So we know from the study in the pre-weaning, they're much more likely to die, but we've also got an exit in pre-calving. Some of it will be mortality, but some of it will also be failure to hit those targets that we want them to get to, failure to get the calf, failure to grow at the right size, that runty calf that's just not a doer anymore. So we know that they're more likely to leave. And if we look further ahead than that, we also see a drop in yield. So this is first lactation yield. And you can see that kind of the middle figure was around 120 litres. The smallest was 57, 58. But actually, the maximum was in the studies we were up to 180. But these are really the animals that we know about as well. So we've got this huge impact on lots of different areas. So actually trying to pull it together to work out cost can be quite difficult. But if we go to the next slide, this is a cost that has now been um, funded around. If you go back to 2000, there is some um, work from Andrew's done, and I think his estimates were somewhere around the 50, 70 pounds mark. Massive, massive growth in the estimation as we know now. That's kind of almost that cost for that extra labour and some treatment. But now we know, we've just shown you that, that drop in growth rates, hugely important. It's going to delay your weaning, especially if it happens in that pre-weaning period. The other thing we've got to remember with calves is their lungs and cows, their lungs are pathetic. Compared to a racehorse, a racehorse will have three times the lung capacity of an adult cow. So we've got these tiny little lungs with tiny little airways, and as soon as we start to damage them, especially early on, we're losing that capacity, we're losing that ability. So we're going to get a decrease in growth rates, which might delay our weaning, might delay our age at first calving, it's definitely going to impact our feed conversion efficiency. And with that, we know we're going to get those decreases in first and second lactation yield. Here in this study, they estimated it to be 4% and 8%, and we know we get a decrease in longevity in terms of the herd. So actually, the, the estimates currently sit around that £772 pounds per heifer, in the, and this is done on data for the UK. So if you think of all the heifers that you've got, how many of those are we treating, and what does that then mean to your herd? And, and you know, anecdotally, you'll go and people will say, oh, no, I remember her, I treated her three or four times as a heifer. She doesn't yield as well, she's not performing as well. You guys see it visually, as it's then also putting the cost on top of it. Thanks, Ginny. That's that's actually really, really useful. Um, the, there's a couple of questions come in and um, I maybe yeah. didn't clarify as we started the webinar as well as I should have. If you've got questions, then please do type them in. There's a small um, white arrow in an orange box that will be up on the top right hand side of your screen. If you pop that panel out, then there is a questions area. Um, type your questions in there and we will do our best to answer as many as we can as we go through the session. But one one that's come in, Ginny, just um, pulling on some of what you were saying there is, is there an age when calves are most at risk of pneumonia? So, yes and no. So in terms of the biggest risk time to have an impact on future production, whether that's growth, whether that's milk yield, survival, is that we know that the earlier they get it, the bigger the impact it is. In terms of age on a farm when they're most likely to get it, it really depends on how you manage those animals, what sheds they're in, what housing they're in, what um, infectious pressures you have on there, what you're feeding them. There's so many things. I suppose that's why we call it that bovine respiratory disease complex. Like it's such a multitude of things is there's the pathogens there's the calf itself and then there's the environment and they all like 
intertwines so well that you often sometimes you can be doing really well and then sometimes you get that perfect storm and it explodes each farm has different triggers and that from that point of view that's the fun bit we've got to work out what your triggers are and how we reduce them um so it's a kind of a cop-out answer i'm afraid jamie but um hopefully that helps yeah, no, not at all. And I think that's what our kind of pneumonia November is is all about at AHDB, trying to acknowledge that the 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 causes of pneumonia can come from a, a, a variety of directions. And so there's not a one size fits all solution on farm and that hopefully people can be encouraged to listen to the webinars that are going to be of most benefit to them and helping you know what's relevant on their farms and i think cat will pick up shortly a little bit about kind of cause hunting i suppose but um Ginny, we we are having a little bit of trouble with your sound but it does seem to be better when you lean a little bit further forward so Sorry. just uh, just before i swap over to to bring cat that little bit further into the conversation um you, you've talked about treatment and you've talked about kind of trying to build the calves own immune system as much as possible um and we've nodded to antibiotics use um uh, earlier on in the conversation um could you just sort of outline a little bit on vaccines and NSAID use maybe um we, we will focus on those things in more depth at a later webinar but i think it'd be a good time just to bring that into the conversation yeah, definitely. And, and Steve, if there is any chance of getting a treatment slide up, that would be brilliant. But don't worry if it's being a pain. Um, in terms of antimicrobial usage, where are we? That is a brilliant question. And it's one that uh, HDB are trying to answer in line with REMA through the Medicine Hub. Um, we don't have that data, if I'm honest, due to the um, numbers of farms that have uptaken the Medicine Hub, but also the difficulty in assigning which drugs are used for which farms. If you're using things like Draxin, so your telomythrosin, your Resnor, your new floor, three floor phenicols, then we can quite easily assign those to calf respiratory disease. But if you're using oxytetracycline, so your anamycin, your endiamycin, as you probably know, we use them for lots of different things on farms. So it, it's really hard for us to benchmark where we are in terms of antimicrobial use. In terms of um, anti-inflammatories, so your pain relief, your metacams, loxicons, ketoprofens, glenixins. Again, we don't have set data, but this graph here that's on the uh, top right, as Miller put it, this is a study that I did with one of our students, Ellie Miller, last year. And um, we were looking at clinical decision making around different diseases in calves, and we asked generically for respiratory disease how likely people were on a scale of always, often, sometimes, rarely, never to use anti inflammatories for treating calves with respiratory disease. And you can see the top boxes are the, the vets in the USA, the UK, and Europe, and the next ones down are the farmers in the USA, UK, and Europe. And you can see that. Farmers, which I take my hat off to you, you're definitely beating the vets, where vets would use them around 60% of the time, farmers are 75% of the time, but we are getting a lot of uptake with the anti-inflammatories and the pain relief. And I think people are starting to really, you know, recognise that we don't just pick up a bottle of antibiotics anymore. Actually, there's so much more going on, as I'm sure Kat will allude to later. You know, there's so many different pathogens involved and quite often we get viruses in there to start with that these anti-inflammatories are hugely important not only from the point of view of respiratory disease is painful but also from kind of a recovery time and also um, making sure that we reduce that inflammation in the lungs we've talked about you know the fact that this disease can destroy chunks of the lungs or well, this is going to help reduce that and actually, if anybody hasn't seen a post-mortem on calf with respiratory disease, I would really strongly encourage you to go to the post-mortem webinar because they are definitely an interesting site to see. In terms of uptake of vaccination, so we've obviously when we get respiratory disease, we've talked about it being this complex. Um, and part of that complex is the, the hosts of the calf themselves. And what we really want is a robust calf with a really good immune system. And we've got you know, a couple of ways we can boost that immune system. And obviously vaccination is one of them. And this is data that I pulled off um, 
HPV actually earlier. Um, where we can see that if we look at from 2011 to last year to 2022, we are having a big increase in uptake in class vaccine sales. And these are predominantly viral. And we know things like RSV and PI3, so the main viruses, tend to be ubiquitous on farm. And similar to us having a flu vaccine, or you know, your kids having the flu vaccine or COVID vaccines, it just helps push. It doesn't mean they're not going to get it, but it does help boost that immune system and ready it ready to go. And then obviously the other one it, it is colostrum. As always with carbs, everything comes back to colostrum, making sure that we've got that passive transfer and, and with that, making sure that we feed our animals well so that we can promote a good immune system. So yeah, hopefully moving away from just the traditional bottle of antibiotics. Thanks for that, Ginny. I think it, it's one of those things, colostrum, good colostrum management, responsible colostrum management just seems to underpin so much of not just calf health, but lifetime productivity of the animal. So it's it might be one of the most basic messages we hear, but it is it just seems to be un, like the foundation of, of everything. And um, Kat, I wonder if I could maybe bring you in on that kind of nutrition side of things now just to just to build on on that point you know what do you see on farm I suppose you're practicing um so I'm sure you see lots yeah no hopefully uh you can all hear and see me now so uh thank you uh Jimmy for that and also Ginny a great start to the evening there covering a lot on um you know the importance of the disease um so yeah on to nutrition I think I think we'll all agree that nationally we generally have been quite poor historically in how we fed our calves, but it's really encouraging to see that um, trial nutrition recently um, found some survey data that the most common um, feeding regime was now six litres. Obviously, it's always difficult with surveys, you know, the farmers that are engaged are going to be the ones that answer and, um, you know, it might be skewed, but it is it promising that more people are feeding more. So um, there's been a lot of uh, discussion over this, I think the last year and two years, as well as what should gold standard be. Um, I'm still of the thought that eight litres, if we're feeding a powdered product, um, is, is the best. Um, when we're looking at growth rates, you know, these we're expecting these calves to do a hell of a lot in this phase. You know, we're expecting them to hopefully survive uh, fight the diseases that they will come into contact with um, to be able to grow an immune system, maintain themselves, maintain their temperature, as well as try and grow lots of organs, which we definitely need um, in these hopefully healthy, resilient animals going forward, um, as well as actually put on frame and growth. So nutrition is really key. And I think a lot of the farms I go to where I get called out to say a pneumonia outbreak, um, it often boils down to, as uh, uh, Ginny hinted at their colostrum, um, but also the, the nutrition following on from that. So I think it's really good that more and more people are feeding that uh, six litres. Um, as I said, I believe gold standard is eight, but it's also encouraging that we're hearing more people maybe starting some ad lib um, feeding systems for that first sort of two or four weeks of life. So they're quite interesting for the future. We, we did actually have a question come in. It was maybe a slightly more general question, but I do think it links to uh, volumes of colostrum around. Are there any breeds of calves which are more susceptible to pneumonia than others? Um, yeah, so from a breed's point of view, there are a few variations. So if we're looking for, say, the double muscled end of the scale, so particularly sort of the, the British blues, then obviously from a lung volume compared to body mass or muscle mass, then they are at a disadvantage. So that's one element um, to consider. So they would be deemed as a high risk calf, I guess, because they're already at that lower lung volume end of the normal spectrum. Um, so that's one thing. But of course, then you get the hybrid vigor argument of because they are a crossbred, then in theory, their immune system will be um, more likely to, to react to it quicker and better. So there's a few arguments to that end of the scale. Um, if we're looking at the other end of the scale and we've got sort of the Jersey calf, 
um, they're also at high risk just mainly because of their sort of temperature regulation side of things. So genetically, um, they're slightly different in their lower critical temperature. So this is the temperature when they have to use their own energy to keep warm. Um, and for a Jersey, that's a lot higher than a lot of other breeds. So that means on most days, basically in the UK, um, they might be feeling cold or at least they'll be using their own energy to keep warm. So then if they do come into contact with a pneumonia virus, then obviously they have less energy to, to play with to fight that off. So they're the two sort of ends of the scale that would be, I would say, the highest risk. Okay, so related to temperature control then, I don't know whether you'd have the numbers to the tip of your tongue, but what would be the lower and higher range, I suppose, that we'd consider acceptable in a in a housed environment for calves? Yeah, so if we take sort of some of the native breeds, so say the Angus, um, for example, then it's stated that their lower critical temperature for that first sort of 10 days of life, which is the really crucial phase, is about 10 degrees. So when it's lower than 10 degrees, that's when they're using their own uh, sort of energy to keep warm. Um, rather than to grow and to grow an immune system. So if we then go to the extreme of the Jersey calf, as I said, then that's often up at 20 degrees. If your housing isn't right and you either put them in a draft and on a wet bed, then that can increase sort of a further 12 degrees. So then you're looking at anything cooler than a 32 degree day, which actually is most of the year. So that's where sort of the temperature as well as the housing design really comes comes together really um, making sure that we do have good ventilation but without drafts and really making sure those beds are well drained and we've got plenty of straw for them to nestle into um so if they've got friends if they're in a group does that affect their ability to keep warm do they keep each other warm how does that work um so there isn't I don't know of any particular research on that. I think when you're looking at groupings, particularly if you are adding heaters into housing, which um, a, a lot of people are moving forward, I think if you're adding that into a group system, then you can definitely see sort of how far the calves are spreading away from that heat source is a really good sign of how much they're using it and sort of fighting over it as such. So that's that's quite a nice um, indication of how much they are using it. And it's nice to see when calves are so, so still spread around the pen. You obviously don't want them clustering too tightly under that heat lamp. But it is clear that they are still using it even with jackets. I think um, jackets have, you know, taken over really. A lot of farms are really using them and they can be really useful. But I think we have to make sure that they are A, cleaned properly, because they can be a great vector of disease as well, particularly spreading crypto from pen to pen. Um, but also they can hide some of those sort of first signs of pneumonia, particularly as well as navel ill. Often those, you know, straps cross over just where that navel is. And it does take that bit of extra stockman stockmanship skill. It's a bit of a tongue twister for this uh, time of the day. Um, to really spot that. So I, I think coats can be useful, but I think if we're really thinking about going into winter, how we can add energy into these calves, then it's really adding some heat sources. And obviously we've got the nutrition of a way of adding in some, some calories into these calves, really. Yeah, so um, as you've touched on, we actually have got a couple of other webinars coming up where we're really going to go into a bit more detail about housing. So we've got Jamie Robertson on the 14th of November talking through about building design. And then we've got a separate webinar all together with Sophie Mahendran and David Ball talking about, you know, what you can do within the building to manage more of a microclimate, I suppose. So we will go into more detail there. But a question has come in, Kat, that would be good if we could address. Um, if someone is measuring the temperature in their building, where would be the best place to locate a thermometer? Okay, so yeah, it's great that we are collecting temperatures. I think a simple sort of minimum maximum uh, temperature gauge is essential for all people who are 
thinking of putting in a winter feeding regime or winter coats or anything because actually it's pointless unless we know when to start it. So as I said, a lot of calves will be um, already in that negative sort of energy space because of the temperatures, but we don't then want temperatures in the UK particularly fluctuating and then say at the weekend it gets hot and we've got to take all the coats off and then put them back on and then put them off again. So we want to be sensible about this and it is difficult to say and I'm sure other people on the call and other people, vets will say different things, but for me when it gets below five degrees for at least five days that's when I think about um, starting it because I think another key thing is we want that consistent milk feeding to be the same. So we definitely don't want to be changing any concentration of milk powders. So we still do the same grams per litre, um, but we can be increasing the volume. Um, and that's where I would say that the greatest gains are for this sort of winter feeding to really maintain that health and growth through the colder periods. Um, I'm just scanning through because we are having quite a few questions coming in, which is brilliant. Keep them coming and we'll probably take quite a few of them at the, at the end so that everyone can get in on the, on answering them. But yeah, I guess um, another one just to finish off the nutrition is, um, as Ginny hinted at, then a lot of people get diseases at a lot of different times, particularly pneumonia. Um, but one of the common ones we do see is around or just after weaning. Um, and particularly as people are maybe feeding more milk, I think weaning can be a more challenging time. So um, a few thoughts of where I think farms do it well and seem to manage this, this step down really nicely is particularly if you're feeding sort of eight litres or more, um, then really trying to make sure we give calves time to adjust to this stepping down. So, I suggest an absolute minimum of two weeks, but ideally I'd want a three week wean down period. So within that, um, I prefer steps rather than a gradual. And so the calves do get a bit of a shock that actually, you know, the milk is getting less and that will really drive concentrate intake. If you are on a say bucket or teetered bucket system and sort of manually feeding calves twice a day, then definitely within that last two weeks period, then you can go down to feeding them once a day and that will really drive concentrate intake. So we're really looking at this energy intake into the calf to be really as, as level as we can get it throughout the weaning period. But within that, we want the milk to be decreasing and the concentrate to be increasing. So it is, is a difficult time. And I think making sure calves have long enough to do that is, is really, really important. Um, and I guess the other question then is the age to wean at, and this does depend on what farms' aims of what they want to get out of their calves are, um, but for a ballpark figure, I think to be weaning off milk at nine weeks and then moving calves to, to, into their different pens or different shed at 10 weeks is, is a really nice sort of rough figure. We can vary it a lot depending on farms, but as, a, as an average figure, um, that seems to work. So again, we're trying to stretch out those stresses. So one week we're doing a nutritional stress and then the next week we're talking about social stresses and sort of moving housing and that kind of thing. Actually, stress management is one of the things that's going to come into one of our later webinars, um, you know, and looking at avoiding stressing calves when their own period is particularly vulnerable to pneumonia so that one is um on the 17th of november that one um we have had a question just someone asking is there a reduced pneumonia risk um for calves to read on whole milk cow's milk rather than powder yeah, so whole milk um, is a great resource if you've got it. Obviously, we need to be really good on your disease monitoring. So things like mycoplasma, um, yonis, TB, salmonella, um, they're all definitely, you know, very scientifically held that we can spread disease directly through milk. So we need to take that into consideration. Uh, we can manage that by disease management of the herd or we can obviously go down the vaccine um, pasteurization route as well. So there are two things just to say sort of off the bat if we're going to consider whole milk feeding. 
Um, and then there is quite a difference between, say, transition milk or what was typically known as waste milk feeding um, compared to sort of out of the bulk tank saleable milk feeding. So if we're looking at saleable milk feeding, then that is a nice consistent product. You know, you'll get that um, daily almost off, off the tanker um, and you can see how consistent a product that is. The trouble is if we're using your transition milk or your waste milk feeding, then that will vary hugely. Um, so we do need to use, keep an eye on that. So we can do that with our bricks refractometer. So the same uh, um, eyepiece that almost is if you're using that for your colostrum management, then you can do that. And that gives you a ballpark figure of how sort of concentrated that milk is. Um, again, if we are focusing on transition milk, this is a great resource. We've got a lot of those sort of follow on um, immunoglobulins so antibodies, um, just like we, we focus on from the colostrum. Obviously, that's not quite as black and white as it's here for six hours and then it's gone over those first four days. You know, the concentration of loads of um, parts of milk is very variable. So we can make use of that. So if we are doing that in a well-managed um, way, then it is a, a great feed source and a really deluxe product if we can do it and manage it well. So those carbs will be at a lower um, disease risk generally because the quality of that milk is, is so great. You know, the fats are there, you've got those, those blood cells in there and you have all the other goodies that colostrum has as well. Okay, fab. Um, if we can just shift the conversation over to um, grouping of calves, group sizes, and maybe, you know, what do you consider to be an acceptable age difference between maybe the youngest and the oldest calf within the same group um, to reduce the risk of pneumonia specifically? Yeah, so when it comes to um, grouping of calves, it is quite a difficult one. And where do you start in this sort of cycle? So I think one key place I start with is the stocking density. So actually how much bedded space do we have per calf? And this is something we can relatively easily manage and measure on farm, which is really great. Um, so there are a few different figures thrown around, um, ranging massively from down at 1.8 meters all the way up to three meters. So there are differences in that. Often the smaller ones are based on sort of individual pen sizes, which obviously we know the disease risk of housing calves individually is a lot less, all the way up to bigger groups, which is where some of the bigger figures come in from. I seem to see a massive uh, improvement of if we can get up around that 2.5 meters squared per calf. So that would be um, the, the aim I would get to if I was to design any shed. So that's the first thing of actually how much space per calf are we going to give them? And then we've got to think about, well, how many are we going to have in the group? So we can go down a few different routes here. And I think the key one there is the age range, as, as you hinted at. Um, if we think about a lot of the diseases that, that we're trying to fight and really are causing problems on farm, then a little bit of this um, webinar might be about scour, um, but that is one of the crucial ones. So if we're thinking particularly about crypto and rotor and the viral causes of scour, then we're really focusing on that first two weeks of life. So for me, if we can try and group calves to within a two week age range, we're really limiting those calves that have, say, got over it and are excreting quite a lot of disease, but are dealing with it compared to that new calf just brought into the pen who has no immunity against these things. So if we can try and limit the pens to two weeks, that will massively help from a sort of disease challenge point of view. And I guess if you know your calving numbers and how even you are if you're an all year round, then that links to group size. Um, but if you are a larger herd, um, particularly those over sort of that 170 to 200, then you're often in that position where you can start to play with numbers because you will have a lot of calves within two weeks. So generally, there's a lot of work to say that uh, less than 10 is a good group. I think with the investment required for machine feeding, I'm happy to push it to 15 
but not much more than that. If we're thinking about particularly diseases such as mycoplasma, there's um, work to show that direct sort of teat to next calf on that teat spread is massive, even with a lot of these machines um, stating that they have sort of teat cleaning between each calves and they're sort of spraying disinfectant in the calf's face and things, we still see that mycoplasma is a real challenge when we get groups of over 15. Okay, so I don't want us to digress too much into other, other challenges, but effectively key message so far is just about creating an environment where they could build the strongest immune system possible and then their best defence is is their own immune system, I suppose. Um, we've talked earlier on about how um, pneumonia can be caused on farms by different things. How can someone on their farm start to work out what could be their major contributing factor to any challenges that they're having? Yeah, I think a really good place to start is sort of um, some treatment records, because as hinted at with uh, Ginny earlier, then actually that can tell you where your bottleneck is from an age point of view and where we really start seeing the problems. So if we start commonly seeing them at say three to four weeks, then that might indicate we've got scour happening say a week before. So that might funnel our focus into those group of calves um, compared to, as I hinted at earlier, if we've got it say in the, in the post weaning phase, then we can really focus our attention on how we're weaning and, and how we're doing that end. So that's a nice place to start. Um, another one, if we're thinking about, is it sort of a disease pressure point of view? Is it just we're exposing these calves to too many bugs? Um, as I said, maybe looking at your, your stocking density is, is a starting point, or you can always um, try and involve your vets and maybe, you know, let off some smoke bombs or see where our ventilation is looking. Just from a visual point of view, not taking any particular accurate measurements, but just seeing what the air flows within the sheds are doing. So they might be two places I might start. Okay, I think now might be a really good time to bring Mike into the conversation. Mike, if you can join us and Kat, maybe you can sort of jump in and jump out as we go. Mike, you... Um, taken steps, I suppose, on your farm to tackle pneumonia, and I know Kat's been involved in that process. So before we get into some of the detail there, do you want to just give us sort of a bit of a picture of your farm and your system, and we'll build the conversation from there? Yeah, thanks, Jamie. Um, yes, if, um, perhaps Steve, could you put the first slide up, please? I think it's uh, a picture does paint a thousand words, as they say. Uh, first slide of the three pictures, if you would. While well, Steve finds that, then you're you're milking quite quite a lot of cows. Are you rearing heifers and beef calves, Mike? Um, we are rearing heifers and beef calves, but as Cat knows that's not by choice at the moment. That's something to do with a 60-day TB test. So, uh, unfortunately, yes, we um, the building. Uh, we got some pictures here below. Um, we previously had a, uh, a, a system where we were finding that we were getting um, higher levels than we would like of pneumonia. We you know, I'm talking of double figures per hundred calves where we're being treated for pneumonia. Um, and we sat down with Kat actually and said, right, where, 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 does, the, where does the problem start? Uh, what, what can we do to change that and what associated benefits can we uh, also get from making a change, making some changes? Because we're not only about improving pneumonia, because that, could that really improve the environment for the, the staff working on the unit, um, you know, the antibiotic usage, I know Kat's touched on that as well. What sort of things could, could we actually action and do um, that would improve pneumonia and those other things. So I think the first thing, the first step we made was sort of looking at where we were getting it, and it was very much in that early period. Uh, the cases of pneumonia we were seeing in um, later uh, life, which was you know in calves that are four to six months old, those were generally reoccurring reoccurring cases. 
So it was key to stop the reoccurring cases in that those buildings. It was key to actually uh, deal with the source. So what we did was actually change the housing. It sounds very radical, but with what we had, what we had to do with regarding labour and um, an actual growth rates and disease control, it was it was the sort of natural thing for us to do. Um, so we did actually the first thing we did was uh, get Cass along and saying what, what what where are we going to be in five years time what's the plan um, and what what do we want to achieve so we looked at uh, the system so we moved from individual pens or grouped pens or when I say group pens I2 in a pen um, to uh, groups of calves uh, and as Kat said, we originally set up for 15. Unfortunately, she doesn't like it because we've got 20 in our pens at the moment due to TV. So we are putting them under a bit more stress than we need to. But uh, as I say, um, so we designed a barn which would um, we could comfortably uh, get um, 100 to 120 calves on at any one time um, and giving a couple of pens a rest. Um, the herd size has grown, which has meant we're just about to do another extension on the building to allow the resting pens, because at the moment we're just I'm working on just in time. Um, so that's the pens are cleaned out and weaned, we're onto it. That's classic, that's classic, isn't it, on farm, that we, we think we've built it big enough and then we expand into something very, very quickly and need to increase the capacity again. But Kat, I mean, what, how important is that rest time that Mike's mentioning there around a building? Yeah, so as, as Mike stated there, we really focused on where the disease was coming from and, and here it was around that four week of age, the pneumonia was, was really starting to, to cause the problem. So we did look uh, younger than that and there was sort of a scour issue which we were managing really well, but it was still there and I think was, was the underlying cause. So for us, that was why the rest period was so vital. Again, there's a big increase in risk from going from paired pens into 15s and are now 20s. So we really thought we really need to get our control of that scour to be able to move them into the bigger group. So that's where we started um, and there really. So Mike, it's quite a big plunge, isn't it, to put the investment into such a facility? I mean, you obviously were thinking long term when you said where would we be in five years time but is it the whole system that makes it work for you the fact that you've got I can see you've got a an air um I don't know what you call them tube yeah yeah tube yeah yeah um and the barriers and the feeders all of that comes at a cost of significant investment yeah, I mean, it was it was an investment. Uh, we could have adapted the buildings that we uh, currently had, but we thought that um, viewing long term, and we knew that the the herd was going to grow, uh, so that this building could be made longer, uh, a larger at uh, later in the uh, in the uh, if required, which the other buildings couldn't. But I think the what um, having looked at a number of uh, different. Um, units and in fact my brother went over to the continent looking at uh, calf rearing units we came back with the decision this is the route we wanted to go and i think it's been borne out in the results and i know the results we are really chuffed with i mean we're now uh, our target bulling weight is um uh we're meeting that by sub 400 days um and in fact in most cases now it's it's actually within the 12 month period uh, so that means we're calving, um, our average age of first calving now is, is down at 23.6 months. Um, and as a result, our antibiotic usage uh, is dropped dramatically as well from improving the housing at the, the early years. Um, and also um, the fact that we've got good disease control as well. So uh, we're, you know, obviously well, TB is an issue in adult animals, but we want to make sure that's not an issue in young stock. And hence, we moved away from whole milk feeding, which is one of the things we, um, as Kat mentioned before, uh, that is really good, but can come can, at can, uh, a bit of a risk. Although we were pasteurizing, we were conscious that there was still an element if pasteurization was not quite up to standard that we could put calves at risk. Um, 
so yeah, it, you know, really getting that disease control, the growth rates is what um, is sort of sort of backed off the the, the, the idea of getting that uh, investment initially. And I think uh, just to put in there, um, it is quite important when you're thinking of do we just update other sheds? Do we start fresh? Do we change our system? Is to really think of what our aims of it are. I think I often go onto farms and sort of my first question is, well, what do you want your calves to do? And often farmers will look at me and be like, well, we want them to live and grow. It's like, well, yeah, but let's get a bit more specific. You know, you 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 might be spending a lot of money here. Um, so getting farmers to think is it the the growth rates and the health which it, it was uh, on, on this unit it, other people it might be looking forward and is it sort of labor they want um sort of good quality labor and they want them to stay so is it actually the ease of the job and maybe the sort of minutes per day per calf that is really motivating them others it might be purely financial or a huge mix of them all so really working out sort of what you want your, your calves to do, and then you can almost create a shed to, to achieve those, hopefully. We've, we've had a couple of questions come in, and Mike, I'm aware, I'm sure you've got lots more to say about, um, you know, we'll move the pictures on a little bit and we'll come back to you. But um, someone was asking, is, is pneumonia transmitted as an airborne problem? And then somebody else has actually asked, um, how much of a difference does the tube make? So, Kat, I'll come to you first, and then Mike, I'll ask you for your experience on the tube. Thanks. Yeah, so um, pneumonia can be spread a number of different ways. A bit will depend on the bug itself. Um, so, for example, mycoplasma is spread sort of orally a lot via the sort of sharing of teats. Um, compared to say the more um, PI3 and RSV, sort of the more true viral causes are more sort of airborne spread. So it does vary a little bit, but we really want those sort of six air changes an hour to really be ventilating these sheds as an absolute minimum. So that's where the tubes sort of come into play. Um, these are tubes that um, I helped uh, the tube company calculate from the Wisconsin um, spreadsheets. So here it's really focusing on we want to be achieving those air changes, but we do not want a draft at that sort of under 1.2 meters. So whenever a calf standing height, um, that, that's what we're working out. So that's what these tubes are designed for. And also, um, I'm not sure if you can see closely enough in these pictures, but there's actually four holes within the tube so we can really target where the air is going. So within these uh, larger pens, I guess it's less important because we want it even throughout the pen we don't want cars clustering in corners for example but say if you had two lines of um, pair pens against one side and maybe groups on the other you can really alter where that fresh air is going and the nice thing about the tubes is they are consistent so every day of the year no matter what the wind direction is no matter how cold it is outside they will be ventilating that shed so if we're trying to design just a naturally ventilated building, then it really varies on what wind direction there is that day, what the wind strength is. And some days it will work, but unfortunately, some days it won't. One question I also often get about the tubes is, won't it make the sheds cold? And actually, car sheds are the only shed on your whole farm that will be the same temperature or lower. So the calves, because we're, we're housing them at quite a low stocking density, because their rumen isn't fully mature yet, they're not really kicking into that biomass boiler and really kicking out that heat from that rumen, then we will never get a stack effect in a calf shed. This is where we're sort of sucking in the clean air. The calves are then sort of warming it up, um, you know, excreting all their bugs, creating this sort of warm, dirty air, which is then rising up through the, the chimney um, through the top. So calves won't make that happen. So that's where the tubes really help. And they're only ever sucking in air from outside, which will be the same temperature. So it shouldn't be colder, um, but hopefully it will help from a humidity point of view. And that's what a lot of farmers really notice first. Mike, what's your yeah. experience of the tube and 
uh, yes, yeah, as, as Ascat said, the tube heat, the, the tube ventilation works really well. You can notice in the pictures there, we've also got infrared uh, heaters. Uh, we do work with calf jackets as well. Uh, when the time, uh, the temperature get drops in within the shed and we're into the um, parameters of uh, getting those jackets on. Um, one of the key things is, is it, it, it does keep the air moving within the shed. Um, we have uh, we have actually since those pictures were taken that they're, they're probably a year or two old actually um, we have actually um, uh, restricted the airflow on the prevailing wind side uh, which has given better functionality to those uh, tube heaters uh, tube heaters uh, tube <laughs> ventilators <laughs> there's me sat in the office with a coat on that's why I'm thinking heater um, uh, so yes, it was. Um, it's they, they've worked a lot better since, um, and we do uh, and we do occasionally smoke bomb in there just to make sure that that, that it is effective, still working effectively. Because it's surprising vegetation grows up around outside of calf buildings, and it can change the dynamic of uh, how ventilation works. And hopefully you've got one of these now as well from AHDB, so you can measure the temperature, which has actually <laughs> got a, a minimum and a maximum. Um, on it, which is particularly useful because just just measuring the temperature at lunchtime when you happen to be passing is perhaps not uh, representative of what it gets to at two o'clock in the morning or something. So um, we've talked about buildings a lot, but that is just one element of things. Mike, do you sort of have a pneumonia action plan? What's the, what's the approach on your farm if you, if despite all of this, you still start to see something that's looking a little bit under the weather, what do you do? Well, first of all, one thing I didn't, did, didn't touch on at the beginning is actually, even though we've done this, we have uh, entered into a vaccination program. Uh, so we are vaccinating uh, against pneumonia in all the calves. We were just doing the black and whites. Um, but seeing as the density of animals has been had to been up to the sheds, we've just recently gone on to vaccinating everything in the building, including the beef animals, even though they are, um, you know, not staying with us for long periods of time. They are leaving us under uh, restricting conditions. Um, so if we do get a case of uh, uh, pneumonia and it requires treatment, then obviously we'd be using whatever's on the protocol for um, antibiotic treatment uh, and, and craft and anti-inflammatory as well. Um, we uh, have had very few cases of pneumonia since we've started the vaccination. That's not saying the vaccine fixes everything, but we just thought that the stage in, at this point in time with pressure that the vaccine was uh, the way to go. Um, so yes, that was uh, the main reason. So Kat, you put in place a, a set of protocols, I guess, around vaccination? Yeah, so um, it's great to have that really close relationship uh, with Mike and the team there. So we have a, a quite a detailed protocol of when to treat animals, because I think it's quite easy, particularly when you're fearing you're at the start of an outbreak to actually over-treat. Um, so it's actually what animals do we need. We take temperatures really, really regularly um, and use that as a great indicator. As you can see, they're on uh, machines. So it's not just if they're keen to come up and feed. I think particularly if you're still on a sort of bucket system, calves are really milk driven, so will come up and feed even if they are quite sick. So it's more looking at how quickly they drink, are they drinking it all or are they sort of messing around? So that that feeding speed is, is really key, as well as their general behavior within the pen. So even though um, the machines are great to help with, with stockmanship, there's still a lot um, and needed to pick up these calves really early. So yeah, we've gone into really good detail on the protocols and then um, trying to do sort of a belt and braces approach from a vaccine point of view. Um, as Mike Kinstat, we, um, we did agree to do the beef as well as um, the heifer replacements here. And that, I think that's really made a difference. Um, they are all sharing the same airspace um, in this setup. They are even sharing the pens. So I think to really treat them equally is vital to get that 
a result from the investment you're putting into your heifers. Um, so that's, yeah, we're working really closely with the team there and really trying to have that sort of two-way conversation. So if we think cases are stepping up one week compared to the other week, then really looking at the, the data we do have. So really regularly trying to take some colostrum ma management bloods and things like that, because that's often the first place to, to look. If you think your housing and nutrition plan is working, then what can change week to week? And it's often the colostrum is the first place to look. Okay. Um, we've got some more questions for Mike, and I'd like to delve a little bit more into kind of um, how you've made sure that everyone in the team knows how to identify problems and you know um, what the protocols are and how you've effectively communicated that among the team. So we'll come to that next. But Ginny, if you could join us again, I have had a, a question come in about um, the the cost benefit of vaccine and relating that back to what's the cost per case of pneumonia. So I thought, Ginny, if you could just reiterate a little bit about how much it costs per case of pneumonia, um, and then we can have a conversation, Kat, about um, the cost of vaccine and the cost, you know, is that an investment that's worth it on farm? So in terms of that cost per case, as we've said, like you'll hear quite a lot of estimates banded around. The one that we're commonly using at the minute is that £732,000. And what we're after is trying to put that car in the best position because COVID was horrible for so many reasons, but it's a great way to explain respiratory disease in cars. If you think about it, when we had COVID, we all went into lockdown. We tried to do similar things, but we tried to do with our cars, reduce contact, improve fresh air, reduce stresses, movements, look after our most vulnerable. But actually, what we're all waiting for our lifeline is that vaccine. And we've been vaccinated and had different things normal. However, the key thing with the vaccine is it's not necessarily stopped us from getting COVID, but it's stopped, it's reduced that severity. And if we go back to why is respiratory disease causing us such an issue, it's more to do with that. How much damage are we causing the lungs? You know, it's great to hear about the protocols and kind of listening to Kat talking about the temperatures being taken and using that data to get that early detection. And vets, we love to bang on about early detection, but ultimately, the earlier detect we detect it, the better our cure rates are, and also the smaller the amount of damage in whatever organ it is, whether it's lungs, mastitis, feet, it doesn't matter. You know, we've reduced the damage that's there and that damage is permanent. So what we're doing with the vaccine is we're priming that car's immune system to say, hey, this is a problem, this shouldn't be here, let's respond and let, let's stop it before it spreads. So don't get me wrong, you can't vaccinate them and put them in housing that doesn't ventilate and overstocks them, you know, it, with 120 or all of different age ranges, it, it's never going to work. It's something that acts in our favour and pushes us similar to that nutrition. If we can give them the right feed, their immune system's ready to respond. So we, we're trying to put them on the foot for me, like that forward, kind of ready to go. In terms of the cost benefit, I don't do clinical kind of day to day practice anymore. So, first thing, I can't tell you the cost of vaccines, but I'm pretty sure it used to be somewhere around seven, eight pounds for an intranasal. Is that about right, Kat? So, we're looking at a cost of respiratory disease looking to be a hundred times more than that cost of an intranasal. It, it, yeah, so I would start to think about that. And the fact that we know quite a lot of those diseases are ubiquitous on farm and they are there, we, yeah. Anything we can do that pushes it in the favour is surely got to be better. And if you start to look at the impacts of things like carbon footprinting, animals that have had respiratory disease have, it's phenomenal from that point of view, let alone health and welfare, let alone your bank balance at the end of the day from an economic point of view. So, yeah, it's trying to push all the odds in favour as far as respiratory disease is concerned. Um, Kat, is there anything to add then? Uh, no, that, that was great. Um, yeah, they're, they're still in that rough ballpark figure of sort of seven to ten pounds. And I think actually a lot of people used to think, is it intranasal or injectable as to sort of the intranasals really get into that key early life period uh, if we're focusing on, on the dairy. 
um, and then last going around that, that 10 to 12 weeks. Um, so maybe just covering into the weaning period, but maybe not. Whereas the injectables, we thought, well, we can get them in maybe at, say, four weeks and eight weeks. So they're covering that post weaning period. But actually more farmers who are really trying to, you know, nail this are doing both, which is which is a, a great story to tell. Um, and it, as Ginny did say, it, it's all about that, that sort of risk-based analysis. Unlike a lot of vaccines, say BVD, which is either you give the vaccine and you aim that, it, you know, you get no PIs board. Um, so that's a definite yes, no sort of answer. With the, with the respiratory ones, I think it is having that understanding that it is just going to lessen the severity and lessen the spreading potential. Um, so we are still going to see cases, um, but it's it's always what what those cases would have looked like if we hadn't have vaccinated. Um, and yeah, when it comes to cost, it, it is where do you draw the line? Because you can easily get sort of the, the treatment cost and maybe the staff time to inject that individual animal. But is that the actual caring of that animal? Is it the growth rates? Is it then the in, you know increased age to service is it then the milk yield it's sort of where do you go so that's why there are so many different figures um banded around as well as obviously the cost of keeping keeping these animals that is changing almost monthly uh with, with the cost of, of everything at the moment okay um so mike we've moved on with the, with the pictures now we're looking at some slightly older calves but if we just think about sort of calf protocols and your team i know you're quite a large farm so you've got a lot of people that are probably looking after your calves how how are you communicating and, and working with the wider team to make sure that everyone's on the same page with regards to pneumonia um it's really down to um training uh com and having those conversations regular meetings um and actually uh you know updating uh, one another uh, whatsapp groups uh obviously work well from a day-to-day -day handover perspective um of information uh but when it comes to that actual uh the protocols yeah it is really about getting trained and there's normally somebody uh coming on and, and and facilitating that quite often that works really well um and that does that does help the message and also, but it's not only about what um, has happened, uh, the protocols, it's actually really getting to people to understand what the long term aim is. So once people see the end of the journey, they can often buy into the beginning part of it as well. Yeah, fab. And I understand that you did do some lung scanning, did you, as part of your kind of tracking process of yes we have um we're still uh, we're still learning uh about it uh, it's quite easy to see um it's quite actually easy to pick it out one of the things we would say is actually that animals that haven't displayed it um doesn't mean they haven't had it is what we find because actually you can find more damage um uh, particularly um on some of the late, late, more later scanning that was done um that uh, that so just uh, to confirm what you're saying there mike is that you were using ultrasound lung scanning on calves that you believe were healthy yeah. and finding lung damage in those despite not having seen any clinical signs of pneumonia whatsoever that's correct yeah that's correct right. okay um, so cat what what does that does that tell us anything or is is that normal on farms i mean most people perhaps don't have the level of data that mike has so yeah no um, it is it is normal so the lung scanning um is relatively i guess new in the uk that there's a few people doing it and some numbers now really starting to increase but it, it's a really nice tool to visually be able to see what is happening within those lungs um you know so we can lung scan anything sort of really below around five to six months i think it is a great one you know our, our scanners can really get that depth in and we can see what those lungs are doing so we will pick up on earlier signs of disease we think that if, if we hadn't have treated at that stage then they might have gone on um but equally i think on farms um such as mike's where, where the nutrition is good the housing is good then i think it's just showing that they are still coming into contact 
with these viruses and with, and with the bacteria, that they are managing to fight them off and to carry on growing with minimal lung damage. Another thing that the lung scanning has really been able to show us is that lungs can heal. So I think historically we always used to say, you know, lungs, as soon as you've had pneumonia, they're scarred. This is going to be a definite lifelong effect. And I think if, if we are really focusing on really prompt treatment, and as Mike said, almost some of these cases, they don't have any signs at all. Um, so how we treat them is, is a challenge and how we're going to get around that in the next few years is going to be difficult. But actually, if we repeatedly scan a calf every week, then they will fluctuate and they, they can heal um, to some extent. Obviously, if, if we're getting to the point where we have serious consolidation of whole sections of lung or abscesses there, then they, they're not going to heal. Whereas if we, we scan lungs and there are um, sort of small areas, so we can see at less than a centimetre of consolidation, then they will heal. And equally, we can pick up on the scanners when there's just inflammation throughout the lungs, so a bit of extra fluid around the lungs, then we can pick that up as well. And sometimes those calves will have temperatures and sometimes they won't. So that, that's the sort of next phase of, I guess, where we're going to look at how we can selectively treat calves. OK, so talking about selective treatment, we did have a question come in asking about whether treatment differs between um, those kind of displaying lesser signs versus those that are perhaps, you know, more obvious. So what's your advice there, Kat? Um, it does vary farm to farm, obviously, depending on which milk contracts you're on will depend on which drugs are available as well. And that always needs to be considered. Um, some farms are moving to, say, just non-steroidals at the very first signs of disease when they are confident that, um, you know, they're picking up cases really well. They've got the disease under control. Um, then that is working really well on some farms and then say 12 hours later just taking temperatures and checking that they're happy that the non steroidal is enough um, so that that is happening on some but it's still not I wouldn't say commonplace and the common option would be to go in take a temperature and then go in with the non steroidal and antibiotic okay and everyone's got a thermometer to take the temperature of a calf in their delegate pack. So that's excellent. Um, yeah, well, it's surprising though, isn't it? Having these things at hand can can make a difference and actually having having a team that have got the right equipment and the the right time and the right attention to detail can can really make a difference in success rates. So yeah. Mike, I suppose you we've we've swapped on to to these different photographs, but we haven't really addressed what what we're looking at here. What are we looking at? So we're we're looking at um, a, a hopefully a very healthy group of animals which have moved through uh, out of the, uh, the calf building into uh, a weaned accommodation, and you can see there that uh, it's just. You know, just trying to demonstrate that if we get everything, if we get the first bit right, the second bit works as well. So what, Mike, for you on your farm, what are the things that you think are kind of the, the three critical factors or however many critical factors? What are the factors that you've got to get right to avoid cases of pneumonia? Um, I think Kat's probably touched on all of it anyway, but yeah, I would say obviously um, environment, uh, nutrition, uh, and um, you know just making sure that the, the animal has the best start in life. And have you seen a difference in kind of team morale as? as you've built the new shed and as you've gotten things you know i know you're on a journey of continuous improvement as every farm is but you know how how does it affect the team um uh, it's obviously it's it's if you get uh, sick animals it's very de demoralizing as we know and it's it's uh, something that uh, um it's very difficult if you stop them and to uh, really um address that it's so you know it really gets people in a not a good place so to have not have that happening is a you know, real positive for uh, the team on the farm and um, you know probably cats noticed the change in 
as well. So, uh, we'll, we'll, you know, if, you, if the vet's not coming and uh, dealing with uh, those animals, then it's uh, uh, it's just as positive for them as well. Yeah, the cat, presumably prevention work is much more fun for you than firefighting work as well. Yeah, no, definitely. We've we've noticed a lot less sort of call out to the the sick young stuff are on this site, whereas. I think um, we've really made the most of I aim to go at least quarterly, sometimes it's more, but often quarterly have a session sort of in the milk shed with the team and then a few of us then going over and sort of having a, a sit down chat over some of the figures and that seems to really be able to spread that throughout everyone. Everyone feels like they, they have their place to, to say their problems um, and equally get rewarded for some of the great results we are getting. So. Um, yeah, I think that definitely is more rewarding uh, for me as the vet working here, and I can see that in the team that they're they're really engaged and moving forward to to really enjoy the next phases of trying to improve it more. Fab, fab. Right, we are moving into the last couple of minutes of the webinar. If anyone's got any final questions that they they want to ask, then please do. Um, hopefully. That the slides will move on, but I'll just go through our panelists again and just sort of ask you to reiterate the the key points, I suppose, around um, pneumonia management. Ginny, I'll come to you first. If you could put your microphone on, sorry. <laughs> sorry, Jamie. It's been a long day. <laughs> Sorry, I was just saying, um, respiratory disease, think of it as a complex, you know, we've got the cough, we've got the environment and we've got the pathogens and they all interact. As Kat was saying, the first thing you need to do is look at your data, what's going on, you know, if you've got lots of animals being treated several times, I'll have a very different conversation with you than if it's kind of lots of animals being treated once. So know what's going on, where are your stress points, where are your weaknesses, have we got all those stresses covered and obviously those will go into more detail in the other webinars but also i was on the farm today and the farmer was saying you know actually don't let bad become normal so don't let walking into a shed of coughing calves oh it's november it's normal it, it might be normal for your farm but what can we do to reduce that because it is having a big impact on that health that welfare aspect your economics and your sustainability and don't forget that you know we're here talking about young stock beef guys that is your ultimate outcome dairy if this is your future herd in two years if you're going to knock them back now they are going to be your ultimate athletes which is what we want our dairy cows to be they're going to still be in their kind of school sports day level races not the olympics so just think about where you know what impact this is having on your business as a much wider impact and i love how you said mike that actually when you see what's coming through and you can see that reflection, that's when people buy in and, and it is something that, you know, you have this legacy going on throughout your kind of system when they're there. Michael, come to you next then. What's your kind of top tips for, for tackling pneumonia? Oh, yeah, I think... <laughs> Pretty much, Ginny covered quite a bit of it there, but I would say, <laughs> identify, you know, identifying it, um, uh, making sure you have a clear uh, action plan and goal of what you're trying to achieve, and making sure that uh, um, you don't accept it. Really, I mean, I think that's one of the key things. Is uh, you, you, you know, that uh, animal is not really going to be uh, a sustainable, healthy animal when she comes to get into the dairy herd. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure that um, I can add much more to what Ginny said. <laughs> what she said. No, but it's a great top tip that we've just brought in at the end there around maybe getting a fresh pair of eyes because what might be considered normal, you become accustomed to slowly over time, and so a fresh pair of eyes is sometimes just what's needed to to give you the reality of where where you compare. So yeah, Cat, over to you. Yeah, I guess leading on from that, I think to try and get this team approach to, to young stock, I think it, it's becoming a lot more common, you know, when we're talking about the adult cows, you know, we'll get the, 
the semen guys in, we'll get the nutritionists in, we'll have the vet, we'll have the farmer as well as everyone else um, is obviously more than welcome and different people bring in different people depending on the, the problems they're facing at the time. But I think having that approach to young stock is really rewarding for everyone in the team and can really push push some of these things forward at a lot faster rate. I think improvements are being made, but I think really if we want to keep up almost with the adult herd, we, we need to maybe be making some of these improvements a bit quicker. So mine would be to try and work as a team and see that as sort of an investment in, in time. Obviously, I can't not say uh, nutrition. Um, I think we, we can't just focus on which bug it is causing the pneumonia or whether it's being spread but actually to, to think of some of these really sort of baseline and bottleneck problems and whether that is uh, nutrition, um, whether that is stocking density or ventilation or anything else, but to really get to the, the base root of that problem. Um, and within that, obviously, colostrum is part of it. So nutrition is, is definitely one to think as a background there. Um, and I think just that idea of getting your data, so whether that is within the team, whether that is one person within the team, but actually making some, some choices off the back of it. It's lovely to collect data, but unless we're going to do anything with it, that's, that's the key step for me to really try to improve um, and move forward. Fab, I think that gives us a really, a really good point. To, to end on really just those those key messages around building the immune system, considering nutrition, thinking about the environment that that animal is is living in, including stocking density, vaccination, and and maybe most important of all, early detection and prompt treatment when you are faced with a challenge. Because as lovely as it is to talk about having re reducing the challenge, the reality of farming is that every day is different every year is different and the challenges keep popping up don't they so mike we know that you take incredible pride in having a very high welfare herd and really are grateful for you kind of sharing sharing the story because when you talk about challenge i i think that um you've really highlighted the long-term effect that addressing a challenge can have and hopefully you will in the business reap the long-term benefits of you know cows with greater longevity as a result of sort of improved early care so yeah good thank you for all of you for for sharing your story um if hopefully we've wet the appetite tonight um on on the topic of pneumonia and hopefully painted a picture that it's not a challenge that we have to deal with every year just because it's november um so we've got a load more webinars in the pipeline listed on the screen there if you want to go on to the ahdb website then you can register for any of them or for all of them if you would like remember that registering means that you'll get um even if you can't listen live you will be sent the recording so it's a, it's a great way to ensure that you're sent that recording but obviously if you listen live we will do our best to answer as many of your questions as possible apologies i know we haven't been able to answer all of them tonight um but a lot of the ones that we left unanswered were quite specific about calf housing so hopefully you can you can take a particular interest in in those webinars that are coming up um so if we flick on one more slide then you should get a qr code which you can use now if you would like to register for any of the any of the other webinars and i just um yeah thank you for your participation thank you for the question thanks for your patience at the beginning when we had a slight false start too early um and if you'd like to continue the pneumonia conversation then don't forget that we are on social media and more than happy to to continue that conversation hopefully you are able to enjoy your delegate packs but make use of them and really really hopefully they make a difference on farm because as as we've talked it, data is fantastic but you have to do something with it so hopefully if you're measuring the temperatures in your sheds you're able to work out if you're creating a good environment or not so with that we will bring things to a close thanks for your time and hope you enjoy the rest of the pneumonia series throughout november night everybody